Uh, now I am. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, I think we'll uh, figure out what's going wrong with our colleague's laptop in a minute. But but for now, let's uh, let's get started. We're almost done. Um, welcome to another lecture, six eight three seven, and congratulations. Uh, I believe most of you have finished your last homework. Um, I enjoyed the unhappy emails I received over the last few days, because uh, as you all know, professors like to sit in a dark basement and brood over all of the <laughs> feedback, which always mysteriously comes the day before things are due. Um, but I digress. Um, sorry, I shouldn't tease, of course, if any of you is experiencing a problem. You, the, I can't, the policy in this class has been the same the whole semester. We're extremely relaxed. If you are running into trouble reaching a deadline and it's, there's some personal circumstance where that phrase is interpreted very broadly, you need to go to talk to SQ. Sending me a, a, a grumpy note about how you don't like the structure of the class, I'm still going to tell you, thank you so much for your feedback. Please go talk to SQ. Um, but I think we know that by now. Then you get your um, grumpy feedback uh, officially approved. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Then I get grumpy feedback from the administration, which is what all professors love. Um, just kidding. No, really. I should, I should be careful about that. Uh, but but uh, in any event, uh, I think most of you guys are done, which means that your last uh, deliverable is uh, the final project. So basically, you, uh, just as a quick reminder, you owe us two things, right? There's a write-up and a presentation. Uh, the course staff and I promise to get uh, to you guys, uh, let's say, by, by the end of the day tomorrow with precisely what the presentations will look like. We keep punting on that. Um, and indeed, a new COVID variant <laughs> just launched last week. So uh, every time we try to make plans for these kinds of things, uh, something gets in the way. Um, but it is time to do the logistics, and, and we'll, we'll certainly figure that out. Um, and then the write-up, I believe, is through the day uh, after. And again, just remember the standard of this project is just to implement something that's like roughly on the order of two homeworks, and that you, know, you can work from a tutorial. This is not my graduate level course where you have to do your own research or come up with something new. Um, so like, I think typically when I see students in this class get stressed out about the project, it's because they've already done about three projects and they're stressed out about the fourth. So uh, just keep it simple, really, and, and aim to structure it in a way where you can pull the ripcord at any moment and have something to show. Right? Like, that's how I would be thinking about structuring my work. Like, I think a lot of times you guys build these really complicated like, dependency graphs and like, you and your partner both have to write like, 10 different modules that talk to each other before you get a single output. And that's, uh, that's not a great way to structure a project for a course, or just in life. Um, so just a thing to think about. Okay, well, if you were doing, let's say, hair processing or liquid whatever, liquid modeling? I don't do hair processing. Hair, hair, hair modeling. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. If you were doing like liquid modeling for your project, uh -huh. then at the beginning, you should have a very simplified, make sure that you have a very simplified water model that may not be realistic, but something to show. Uh, that specific example is a little tricky. I'm not sure what a simplified water model would look like beyond incompressible Navier-Stokes, but I do think that you can sort of come up with, you know, kind of like slow but effective solvers for your problem and then make it fast or something like that would be a reasonable approach. Yeah, and I, I know the topic of your project, so, so well, that is an interesting piece of advice. Thankfully, it is not um, relevant to your life. Uh, any questions about the project or the remaining logistics of this course? Oh, and you have a nano quiz. It's on Thursday. Um, you didn't realize it this semester, but actually your nano quizzes were every other lecture. They weren't every Tuesday, you see. Uh, so since we had uh, Thursday off last week, now it's, it's on Thursday. So that'll be the last one. Oh, yeah, and then next Tuesday is um, a special lecture. I request that you guys are kind enough to join us in person, but every year I say that and every year you don't. Um, but essentially, uh, what we usually do is we ask for graduate students, researchers, other folks uh, in CSAIL and in MIT more broadly to come and present what they're up to in the sort of graphics research world. Um, now you guys have the basic language to understand what a lot of these different projects are like. And essentially this is a nice way to kind of get an idea of like cutting edge and what's interesting academically in this, uh, this field. One thing you'll find, which is not terribly surprising given how like kind of all over the place this course is, is that these people do a huge variety of stuff, everything from animation to robotics to like optimization and, and all kinds of things in between. Um, so over this week, I'll try to, uh, you know, strong arm my, my colleagues into uh, doing that. And of course, my own graduate students are, are uh, obligated. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'll try to share the program with you guys. Typically, that's a bit of a shorter lecture. I probably will not film that one because I don't have everybody's permission to put their content on the internet. 
Um, but the good news is there is no nano quiz covering it. They're not responsible for it. You could care less if you show up. So don't send me a note asking if it's covered on the nano quiz. That makes me sad. It's a bunch of people that want to share what they're up to. Um, also, it's a, a good way to find Europe and, and uh, you know, like research opportunities in this space. Uh, many of these people are looking for undergrads to work with, and you get some idea of uh, the right, for, you know, like when you write that Europe email and you say like, oh my god, I'm so excited about your work on X, and I'm wondering why. Like, this is a good place to find language that you can echo back in that email. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Probably here in person. Yeah. Well, I invite Wojtek. I will gladly invite Wojtek. Um, I, will, will I will refrain from giving odds on, on whether he will be available, but um, perhaps he will. And certainly some of his group members uh, can, can come join us. Um, yeah. Any other uh, uh, questions? Oh, this is all on YouTube. I should be careful. OK. So with that, uh, let's get uh, talking about a topic that uh, we're going to cover for one lecture, which is a completely different branch of computer graphics than all the other stuff we've done. Uh, as with many topics that happen in this course, unfortunately, computer graphics as uh, sort of roughly represented by things that appear at the CGRAPH conference or like, you know, graphics researchers care about is this gigantic research field that's chock full of like people working on all kinds of things that are roughly sort of visual computing oriented. And one of those spaces which is particularly popular and important is image processing and adjacent to that is computational photography. Now, MIT offers an entire course on this topic. Um, Fredo Durand, who's a faculty member right across the hallway from me, um, yes, Hart, um, he uh, is, is obviously much more knowledgeable about these topics than, than I am and, and teaches an entire course, 68359-6817. So I encourage you to go uh, take his course. But um, even in an intro graphics course, it is worth acknowledging and, and thinking about some of these topics because it really is a major application of computer graphics. Moreover, it's not just photography that uh, is affected by developments in this area. Um, you know, I think a lot of us, when we think of like image filtering and image processing, computational photography, we think of like that sepia tone filter on Instagram. I don't know if that's still a thing. Um, but, but the reality is that basically even rendered content that we generate using graphics pipeline often gets post-processed using techniques like this before it's displayed on the screen. Um, in fact, a lot of these things can be implemented in shaders. I know, for example, Ari and Daniel are working on tune shading, and that's a nice example where somehow you render a scene, and then you can kind of understand some tune shaders as doing a second pass over the rendered image to make it kind of more 2D um, looking. So some of these multi-pass uh, rendering techniques that we can, we, we've already talked about certainly fall into this category. Um, we've also already talked about you know, anti-aliasing, Fourier analysis, all that kind of stuff, and of course, that's extremely relevant uh, here. So essentially, we spent all this time in this course on 3D stuff. Um, today, we're going to be back to 2D, because all of our data is mostly just sitting on a pixel grid. Right? So this is like all the stuff that happens after I generate a bunch of pixel colors on the screen. I'm still not done. Right? And so for example, in our previous lecture, we already saw some really simple examples of that. If you recall, uh, we talked about gamma uh, filtering, where I might take the uh, colors that I have like, on my, my grid of pixels and run them through some exponential. And if you recall, the reason for that was to kind of account for the fact that I want to use bits like, you know, the distance between numbers in my number system should maybe be uniform in perception rather than like in the amount of electricity that goes into my pixel. And in particular, your eye is sensitive to ratios, so it might make sense to like use more bits for like darker colors or something like that. And that's sort of what uh, gamma correction was doing. The gamma correction is also just a really simple image filter, right? I looped over all the pixels of my image and I applied some formula to it. So today we're going to be mostly talking about 2D stuff. We'll talk a little bit about 3D, but mostly just in a context which is a little bit different, which is if you think of like a, a video sequence, then in some sense that's like a big cube worth of, of, of pixel values, right? Like one image stacked on top of another. Of course, you have to be a little bit careful with that perspective because the x, y axes need to be treated very different from the, the t-axis in, in most uh, image filtering techniques. But of course, these days, uh, thanks to like specifically TensorFlow, all of us think about this thing in exactly that language, right? Like you think of a video as just a giant block of, of numbers. That's actually kind of a reasonable thing to, to do. OK, so a lot of times, the, the first thing I should do is give you a little bit of, of code word for, for how to understand both you know, algorithms, research papers, whatever, in this image processing space, because they tend to use a lot of different 
language. In fact, um, I've personally worked in this space a bit, and like whether I'm talking to a measure theorist or like an image processing engineer, I have to like change my notation to communicate exactly the same idea. Um, and the reason for that is that I think all of us, when we think about images and, and graphics problems more generally, we kind of have two feet in two very different perspectives, right? On the one hand, we're on a computer and we're doing everything discreetly and we have this pixel grid. On the other hand, we have this like continuum of colors in front of us. And for some image filtering methods, it's better to think of it as like maybe a function of x comma y. And then other ones, it's better to think of it as more a thing operating on a pixel grid. And it's very typical and the tiniest bit frustrating to read literature in this space because they kind of go back and forth across that transition pretty seamlessly. So in particular, you know, we often think about pictures as basically like a two-dimensional array of, of color values. Oftentimes, um, if you think of that array as sort of taking a limit as it gets denser and denser and denser, a lot of the image filters that we'll discuss today actually have a perfectly reasonable interpretation as a thing that like inputs a function of x comma y and outputs another function. Um, and that perspective can be useful uh, too. So for example, if you take a really advanced course in this stuff and you study something called total variation, um, one thing you'll notice is that most of the formulas involve like lots of integrals and gradients and things. Um, and in fact, these ideas are really making a comeback. Um, so just in the last year or two, these sort of interesting neural image representations are kind of converting from one to the other. Um, in particular, oftentimes they'll find a function f of x comma y that kind of fits the colors that you have on a pixel grid and then represent that function using like a neural network or something, edit the network and then put it back. Um, and there's some really interesting uh, things that you can do with that. So if you Google phrases like deep image prior, you'll see uh, all kinds of, of modern research on these. But from our perspective, essentially, <laughs> the only thing to, to remember uh, is that um, depending on who's textbook you read, you'll either see like sums or integrals, and they basically mean the same thing, right? <laughs> it's just whether or not you're thinking of like this discrete set of pixels or some, some function. Um, in this lecture, we're going to try and stay on the left-hand side because I think that's what most undergrads are, are kind of comfortable with, um, but as a math person, I might slip over to the right every once in a while. I love these topics, by the way. I, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of total variation, which is totally useless, but you can prove lots of theorems about it. Um, right, so and again, if you think of images as a function of x comma y, then of course video might be a function of x comma y comma t, and a lot of the filters that we talk about can really just be extended uh, in that fashion. In fact, that's really important. Um, so for a long time, um, gosh, I spent about five years working in a, a research field that was quite different from my own, which is this field called non-photorealistic rendering, which is exactly what it sounds like, um, NPR. Uh, the basic motivation there is that um, if you think about animated films, you know, like Wally or whatever it is the kids watch these days, they all have a very similar look, right? Like they all, they all have, they look like a 3D film. And does that look like real life? I would argue not really, but they all have a very consistent look. Um, and if you think about it, that's a, a really great inspiration for some, some kind of research question, which is like, okay, well, we've all kind of converged on this technique for art and for rendering, which has a particular look and is built off of some pseudo physics that we've done in this course, basically. But at the end of the day, the end result is self-consistent, but it's not consistent with real life. If that's really the case, then the question that, that people ask in non-photorealistic rendering is like, okay, well, why not explore other looks? Like, okay, this is one look for a film, but like we're completely unconstrained. We can do whatever we want with our pixel colors. Like, let's like make things look painted or invent something completely new that a computer can do, whatever. So one of the interesting challenges that comes up in non-photorealistic rendering has to do with exactly these image processing questions. And it's something that I think you can keep in the back of your head here. So like, let's say that I have a super cool image filter. It like takes a photo, you know, I walk up to uh, my colleagues in the front row here. They don't know it because they're looking at their laptops, but I take their picture. And now I put my favorite image filter on it and it looks like, you know, it's painted with Van Gogh or something. And that filter is really great. I, you know, it looks awesome. I see, you know, uh, whatever, uh, you know, Ari, and she's got, you know, Starry Night behind her. That's Van Gogh, right? Uh, now that filter is really great. And now I take my camera and I pan it across the room, and I apply my filter to every single frame of that video sequence. So I take every frame of my video, and I make it look like Starry Night. <laughs> is that video necessarily going to look very good? even if the individual frames, like I freeze at any moment, look awesome. 
Everybody's shaking their head. Why? Maria. Right. They might not be temporally coherent, right? And that's a big problem. So a lot of these image filtering things that we'll talk about today are really great for individual frames. But once you put in that t-axis, suddenly a lot of really crazy stuff starts to happen, right? Because a lot of these filters are incorporating random numbers and other things. Um, temporally coherent random numbers, are, it turns out, are, are pretty hard to generate. Not impossible, actually. There are a few interesting research papers I can point you to that have these really bizarre like patterns of white noise on an image. And then you like play an animation, and you see the white noise kind of moving the image, and then you pause it, and then suddenly you can't see the, the edges in the image anymore. I found this to be the most impressive research result, um, but I digress. OK, so of course, when we talk about images, we think of them as an array. And in this class so far, basically our images have looked something like this. right? Our model has been a big grid of, of RGB colors. And now by the end of this course, we know just about everything about the uh, provenance of and reasoning for these RGB colors. right? Remember that from our previous lecture now, we know that RGB has nothing to do with how light works and everything to do with how your eyeball works. right? Like, so in fact, our whole computational pipeline actually has some little aspect of cognition kind of built into it, which is cool if you think about it. Um, and moreover, I think in this class, we've mostly thought of pixel colors as between 0 and 1. Of course, depending on what convention you use, that might be scaled up or down. That's not a big deal. But it turns out that a lot of image formats really don't just contain these three numbers. They often have a fourth. Um, does anybody know what that's uh, called? I'm sure you've played with it before. Alpha. alpha. That's right. So uh, basically, alpha is going to be some version of transparency. Um, I spent a, lot, a weirdly large amount of time preparing this lecture to find a really good example of bad compositing. Um, it turns out they're not that hard to find, but I had a lot of fun on YouTube. Um, and the best example I was able to find, which is unsurprising, um, was this, this uh, you know, music video, which you might be familiar with. I suppose it's a little bit dated now. Um, but of course, we see you know, uh, our, our colleague Rebecca is singing about Friday. And you know, unfortunately, well, she would like to be in all kinds of cool party environments. The reality is she's doing the whole thing in front of a bright green screen. So first of all, why, why, why do that? Like, what is singing this song in front of, <laughs> singing is debatable, uh, making sound in front of this, this green screen really, really doing? Like, why, why do we do that? What's going on? Why do like newscasters? That's right. So we've got her singing. We're going to splice her out of this green environment, find all the pixels which are close to bright green, uh, which is obviously quite, I hope, different from her skin tone. Uh, now uh, we can take all the green pixels and replace them with some other cool background image. And um, then we have what we call a composited image. Right. And by the way, this doesn't just happen with bad early 2000s music videos. Um, most of the movie scenes that you see today are probably composited together many different layers. Um, because it wouldn't make sense to just render it in one shot, right? That would be extremely inefficient. And moreover, if I like wanted to fix the Hulk, you know, I have to like resolve the reflection of like the Hulk's eyeball off of. Uh, I'm running out of characters. Bruce Banner. That is the Hulk. Loki. Loki's elbow. That would be that would be a lot of computation, right? So so typically, oftentimes like many different aspects of a scene will be rendered into different images and then kind of glued together in the last uh, pass. It just doesn't look as bad as this. Now, when I say that it looks bad, um, this is a great example where we can see that the computational model actually is really not sufficient for what we're trying to do here, which is to take, in some sense, a live character and composite them on a digital background. And in particular, I've, I've zoomed into her shoulder here. And we can see that like, somehow, somehow Rebecca here has this strange artifact. Her shoulders are like lighting up. Now that, I mean, if you think about it too hard, you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll tie yourself up in knots trying to figure out, like, where is the light bulb in this scene? Right? It's really, like, is it like, directly behind her? Like, why is she lighting up like that? So, so what's going wrong? If you're wondering, your instructor found a lot, it took a lot of time to find this really bad example. Yes? Uh, isn't that like they're doing the lighting really badly on the green screen, so the lighting is reflecting the light and actually showing off the green screen? That's right. So, there's a, the, so she's standing in front of the green screen. It's probably in a very well-lit room. The light is bouncing off this green screen and onto her shoulder. And now there's a problem, which is there's this transition of color from the color of her, her shoulder or her sweater or whatever into the, this bright green background. And at some point, you have to choose. Like, is this color part of the alpha or is it part of Rebecca? Uh, and that's exactly what you're seeing at that interface there, right? Um, so we'll come back to that in a, th a second. You guys should think a little bit about like, how you might solve this problem. 
Right, so in general, uh, this uh, is a world famous example of compositing, which basically is the idea of taking visual elements from lots of different sources. And when I say sources, it could be like one is a video and the other is digitally created, or one is ray traced and another is rasterized, is another very typical thing that happens in the movie industry. And now um, I want to put them all together into a single image. And in order to do that, as we've already discussed, a very typical thing to do is to store our images not just with red, green, and blue, but also this fourth channel alpha. Right? So alpha here is going to be transparency. And you can kind of think of it as like the fraction of the pixel, which is covered like as a, as a foreground layer. We're going to see that that analogy is a little hard to think about. It's not necessarily commutative, um, which is kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, so essentially, what is that green screen doing? It's taking the green channel of the input video and then just kind of dropping that into the alpha, probably with a little bit of like, you know, something to wash it out a bit. Um, okay, so once I have an image with this alpha channel, the question is, how do I composite stuff together? And the formulas are pretty much what you would guess, right? So, so here is a very simple uh, example. So let's say that I have an image, which is the background. Right, so that's like that super cool, like kind of generic purple black thing behind Rebecca. And now I have our actor in the front. I want to composite them together. Then essentially, in order to create that composited image, I just take a weighted average. Right? So you can see that when the alpha is equal to 1, I take C sub F, which is the foreground color. And then as alpha goes to 0, I take C sub B, and that gives me the background. Does that make sense? So this is a very typical thing to do. Right? Like when you download photos off the internet, and they have that little checkerboard texture in the background, Typically, what they've done is just done this formula, but where C sub B is that checkerboard uh, pattern, just so you can kind of see the transparency in the image that you download. Now, uh, one term that you, you might want to remember is something called pre-multiplied alpha. Uh, the idea here is that there's very rarely do you actually need the alpha image that hasn't already been composited on top of something else. So you can save yourself one multiply in your graphic system by storing this number, alpha times C sub F, in your image file instead of C sub F. Because the very first thing you're going to do with your image is composite it on top of whatever you already have. So you might as well save yourself that, that multiply. Yeah? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's probably going on there is they took the green channel of her video. And they have some parameter, right, which is like you're within some distance of 0, 255, 0, right? And if, if you're within that distance, you make alpha 1 or 0. And if you're if away from that distance, you make it 1, right? And probably what happened is that that threshold was too sharp. And so it was like adding some green stuff to her shoulder that should have been background. But the reality is just that the lighting makes it basically impossible to get this correct, right? That like the light coming off of that screen and onto her shoulder is just inconsistent with what's behind her. And so no matter what you do, you're either going to take a bite out of her shoulder or you're going to have that artifact. Um, yeah. Uh, and so that allows us to do many things. Of course, all of us have taken middle school portraits. Uh, my particular one was on some railing that looked kind of like that one, like on its head. And I will forever suffer from that on my parents' shelf. Um, but of course, we can take any of our favorite 90 guy, 90s guys in you know, leather jackets and, and put them on in front of a palm tree or, or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong with that, right? There's subtle artifacts like lighting is really hard to get correct because the background image needs to kind of match in the lighting with the light that's on the character in the front. For example, it's impossible to have like inner reflections between those two things. Uh, in fact, actually, I got really stressed out during the Thanksgiving parade last week, uh, last week because they had um, this cutaway to like Mariah Carey or somebody singing a Christmas song and like they composited her in front of this like she clearly didn't want to be in a room with her backup singers. Like it's probably some COVID thing, and like it just made like the more you looked at it, like the more the lighting just didn't make any sense at all. Like the singer, the lighting was coming from one side, and the backup singers like completely the other, and there were no shadows. Like the shadows were like, it was bizarre. But anyway, anyway, um, this is the thing nobody ever gets right, um, and it really stresses graphics professors out. Um, and of course, this is a phenomenon that happens all over the place. Here's another kind of. You know, example, the, the audio doesn't really matter here. Right. So obviously what's gone on here is that, uh, you know, our newscaster forgot that she was going to be in front of a green screen and is probably wearing a green shirt. Yeah. Um, 
Right. So, so I mean, there are many questions here. Uh, one question that you might ask is, well, why is the green screen green? Yeah. That's right. Like, like I think there's like very few really bright green things in, in the universe. There are like sometimes bright blue screens as well, and and um, there's a bit of a trade-off. The green screen is green because that's a color that's pretty rare in in filming. On the other hand, it's so bright that you have these artifacts where it casts light, like secondary stuff, onto your characters. So I think that's why sometimes you see these blue screens where it's a little bit darker and 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 blends a little bit easier. Um, yeah. OK, so um, in general, uh, it turns out that alpha channels have their own algebra associated with them. Um, there's actually some really fun uh, math that you can do here um, to do all kinds of things, kind of similar to what we did in that ray tracing lecture. Remember in ray tracing, we took like intersections and unions of shapes and XORs and Boolean stuff. You can do exactly the same thing with compositing. Um, so here's a bunch of different filters. By the way, if you're like, that guy behind the camera with that, you know, all the sliders and things that, you know, operating the different cameras in the news studio. Often these are different buttons you can turn on and off. Um, so, for example, let's say that I had A and B were images and I want their intersection. How would I get that as an alpha channel? So, remember, the alpha is one inside of a shape and zero outside. All right, so now I have an alpha channel associated with A, like the square. I have another alpha channel associated with B, like the circle. So if I want their intersection, what do I do? Yeah, Corey. What was that? Yeah, so in stands for intersection. What's the formula for the alpha? And um, is, is probably not something I could implement in double precision floating point. So what would I do instead? Rhymes with uh, <laughs> something uh, uh, multiply. Yeah, we multiply, right? Because like, think about what happens. So remember, the alpha is one when I'm on the inside and zero on the outside, yeah? Um, so in this uh, inside region here, these two alpha values multiply to one, which is inside. And if either one of them is zero, then I'm outside, right? Similarly, if I wanted to take uh, some kind of union, how could I do that? Yeah, the sum minus the product would be one way to do it, or take the sum and clip it at one. This is, turns out that's the same thing. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, you can kind of work out all these different filters um, as formulas in terms of the RGB of the first guy, the RGB of the second one, and their, their alpha channels, which is kind of neat. So you can have like, you know, characters that walk past each other, and you like only see either of the characters when they're, you know, like on top of each other or something. Um, or the opposite of that, you know, like, like some Power Rangers kind of thing. You walk into each other, and then they disappear. In general, all of these filters are examples of the world's simplest uh, image filters, right? Where essentially, you have some function that inputs RGB or RGBA for every single pixel, and outputs some other value RGBA uh, per pixel. Um, of course, these are great things to implement on your computer graphics card because they are SIMD operations. Uh, does anybody remember what that stands for? Yeah, somebody does, just not, not our colleague here. Uh, that's absolutely right. Single instruction, multiple data. Anybody want to tell us what that means? Not Daniel, apparently. Yeah, but yeah why don't you guess? It means that we're having the same formula, but we're operating on a bunch of different data. That's right. See, you knew more than you thought you did. Um, and why do we like SIMD operations? Yes? Because you can run them in parallel. I can do them in parallel. In particular, I have. It is exactly how shaders work, and shaders run on your CPU. graphics card, right? So your graphics card is this giant sledgehammer whose job in life is to do SIMD stuff. And of course, many image filters, not all, but many, uh, fit into uh, this, this uh, framework quite nicely. Of course, if you play with like Adobe Photoshop or whatever your favorite photo editing tool is, the little iPhone editing thing, the vast majority of image filters that you're playing with really are very simple, like per pixel filters. Um, so, for example, you know, if I want to increase the brightness of my image, probably I just take the red, green, and blue channels and multiply them by some constant. Um, what could go wrong with this filter, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. If you if you like multiply it by too big a constant, you're going to get colors bigger than one, and so what will happen is you'll get these regions that look kind of blown out, which as many of us have probably experienced. Right? There's that whole blog of bad HDR photos. I think there are many blogs of this, and. and um, that's one of many bad things that can, can happen. Um, 
here's another good uh, image filter. So this is one that you've probably played with on your phone for contrast. So what is contrast, by the way? Do you have any idea, like roughly, like why, why we might want to increase the, the contrast of an image? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a ratio. So, so think about, Maria, you're dying to tell me. Yeah. It's exactly right. So, so like in particular, like this, this kind of ugly photo on the left-hand side is using like a relatively small range of colors, and your display is capable of many more, right? And so a very typical thing to do, um, which we call contrast enhancement, is to just try and kind of saturate the range of colors that are available on my display a little more than, than I, I have. So if I wanted to come up with a simple like per pixel image filter, what's, what would be a way to do that? Does anybody have any ideas? There are no wrong, well, there's some wrong answers, but there are many right answers. So again, like I have some range, say from A to B, of color, uh, you know, like intensity values in my image, and A and B are like within the interval zero to one. What might I do? I see the right hand gesture from my colleague who was on my flight the other day. <laughs> no? OK. Um, well, the hand gesture he was uh, uh, making was indicative of this function here, where essentially what I'm going to do is take that range from the min to the max color, and then maybe map them to, to the range from 0 to 1. Right? And so there's a very typical uh, visualization that we have um, on, on w w when, when you talk about filters like this which is like the thing on the bottom is like the histogram of colors in your image. And then you take all the, the pixel colors of the image, you run it through your filter, and then the thing you see on the vertical axis is the histogram of colors that result. In this case, you can see it's pretty simple, right? It's just taking that histogram and kind of stretching it out. Any questions about that? Cool. So these things aren't hard to engineer. I mean, this is why, you know, all of Instagram was like weirdly sepia toned for a while, because that was just like the easiest filter that people could come up with. Like, Apparently, the guys in the dorm down the road for me. I wish I were living down the road. Um, but uh, in any event, um, there are many of these. You know, another one would be to convert things to uh, grayscale. Um, can anybody give me a reasonable formula? RG. What was that? Average of, RG. Average of R, G, and B. Yeah, that's a reasonable formula. Can somebody give me a better formula? Norm. What was that? Norm. The norm. Uh, tell me more. I would argue that he just gave me the L1 norm. I guess I'll propose the L2 norm. <laughs> OK. That, that, that is a, a formula. Uh, any, any other uh, guesses? Yeah. Yes, the weights are weird. Why are they weird? What was that? More appealing? Um, Yeah, so you might add some nonlinearity, but but let's 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 continue going down this road for a minute. So so it's absolutely right. I might have some weighted average of R, G, and B, and the weights might not be just like one third, one third, one third. What do we know about R, G, and B? Like, remember how how rods and cones work? Do you have equal amount of sensitivity to all three? No. So so what might I want to do? You're most sensitive to uh, red, I believe, or or green, maybe. I forget. <laughs> So a very typical thing to do might be to have a weighted average that accounts for your sensitivity, and also, by the way, to account for like the pattern of sensors in your camera. Right? It might be that you have like half as many um, red and blue filters as you do green, or something like that. In which case, maybe you want to weight that one up because it's more accurate. Um, so this is just all to say that uh, it's actually usually not just a, 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 an average of all three channels, but something a little bit more complicated. Uh, to come back to the norm thing, I think perception we usually think of as a linear phenomenon uh, in this particular case. So I'd have to think about what an L2 norm would do, but, but perhaps. Uh, we're back on our laptop. OK, so uh, in general, we can uh, design image filters um, that, that are just functions, right? They input R, G, and B, and they output other R, G, and Bs. Um, and in general, um, many of you have probably encountered a user interface, like the one I'm showing you on the screen here. And essentially, all that's doing is just designing that function f, right? So you draw this little curve here. And essentially, this is sort of like taking a linear color from black to white. You map it through this function, and then it outputs the, the output color there. And then the kind of nice thing about this visualization is oftentimes it'll show you the kind of distribution of pixel colors that you get after having run your, your image through this filter. 
that's kind of useful because like oftentimes you kind of want to make I'm not an artist, but oftentimes people want to make kind of even use of all the different parts of the intensity scale. And so a very typical thing to do is to design these functions in a way that takes a, maybe like a really peaky histogram and kind of spreads it out over a wider range. Um, and that's, that's the sort of contra contrast uh, enhancement idea. Uh, in fact, in um, medical image processing, this is particularly important. Um, so if you like go get your x-ray or um, like I got an MRI a couple months ago, it was no fun at all. I never realized how long those take. Yeah, I thought, it, you know, like from, you know, watching like Dr. McDreamy, I kind of thought it was like they put you in the tube and you come out the other side or something and they have an image, but, you know, they like slide you in there and then there's like this jackhammer going for like an hour. I, it, was, it was horrible. Uh, this is a, you think the shtick in this, this classroom is bad. <laughs> um, right, but uh, in any event, um, in medical image processing, typically there's this very low contrast images that come out of modalities like X-ray and MRI. And of course, your doctor's job is to find some tiny smudge, which is like a cavity in your teeth or whatever. And so they do all kinds of really crazy contrast enhancement uh, techniques to, to make that more obvious. In fact, um, if you read up in that uh, literature, a very typical thing to do is, um, what is the acronym? C-L-A-H-E, CLAHE, which is Contrast Limited Adaptive Histogram Equalization. Um, that's, I think, the sort of typical algorithm that's implemented in the MRI and, and uh, X-ray machine. And essentially what it's doing is it's learning or like computing this function here to flatten out that histogram, so to make completely even use of all the colors. Um, but one thing that can happen is that like, maybe you have one really bright spot in your X-ray and then the rest of it is just really gray, like, I don't know, there's like bones somewhere. And like, that's not really useful because you're not just looking for like the giant bone that was in front of you, you probably could have found that. Um, so instead what they do is they kind of take a little sliding window of histograms in like a local neighborhood around a pixel and then simulate what histogram equalization would look like in that neighborhood and then that's that pixel color. Um, and that's the typical way that people process um, medical image uh, data. So in other words, you basically have this function that we're drawing here is now a function of your spatial location in the image. How do you think people design these functions? Like what do you think is driving this, uh, this little tool here? Give you a hint, we covered it in lecture two. The spline, yeah. So you can't escape it, it's here again. All right, so, so far we've talked about pretty simple per pixel uh, filters, um, but they're more complicated ones. So if you take uh, Fredo's class, I think you'll learn quite a bit about high dynamic range photography. So I know some of you guys are in that course, so you can tell me all the things I get wrong. Um, so in general, um, <laughs> you see a lot of photos of churches when you, when you see test cases for uh, high dynamic range photography. So in general, high dynamic range photography is when you're taking a picture of a scene and it has like really, really dark stuff and really, really light stuff. Right? That's the dynamic range of your photo. Why do you think it's churches? Why, why do we see so many? Like the Stanford church is a very famous example. It shows up in a lot of the, the test data. Yeah. That's right. There's interesting stuff in the dark and the light spots, and there tends to be one giant light thing right in front of you, which is that stained glass window. And so what typically happens, you know, if you like took a what kind of low grade like Polaroid camera, you know, if you take a photo in this church, as you'd see like the window and then a bunch of black, right? Or depending on how long you left your shutter open, you would either see that or you would see a completely blown out window, like just white and the details in the church wall, but you can't get them both, right? And 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 so that's sort of a physical issue. So, so here's another illustration of that phenomenon. So here we have different f-stops on your, your camera. So this has to do with how long the shutter is open. Right? So the longer it's open, the more light goes in. So it turns out taking a photo of the sun does not require a very long uh, exposure time. Um, I'll let you guys figure out why. Uh, and of course, as I increase my exposure time, what happens? Well, I get all the nice grass in this photo. You think that this person who making this example could have found a better scene. Um, but now the sun has turned into just like a giant white blob. Um, and in fact, this is just a really big issue. Like a lot of the interesting scenes that we want to photograph have this huge dynamic range, right? So for example, like a sunny landscape can have ratios of like 100,000 to one uh, in terms of brightness for stuff that you might want to uh, capture. Um, on the other hand, of course, you know, for certain displays, the dynamic range is quite limited. You know, like a glossy piece of paper is roughly 250 to one or like a matte sheet, like this thing uh, is like 50 to one, which is not all that surprising. How could I solve this issue? I mean, like if I have a camera, 
it, like I'm kind of hosed, right? If I take a photo, like I have to choose one of these these f stops, and then then I'm done. Uh, yeah, George. Take multiple multiple photos at different f stops and combine them. Yeah, so that's one solution. So this is a, a technique called exposure fusion. Um, so basically, what I could do is take a bunch of those different photographs. And now try to combine, you know, like in the dark regions, maybe take things from the, the, the quick exposure region, and in the light areas, take things from the, the dark exposure uh, region. Did I get that right? I think I did. Um, and yeah, that's a very typical uh, kind of technique. Now, this is very common in churches. It's a little bit less common in basketball games. Uh, why would that be? You have motion, right? And so if I'm, I'm dribbling a basketball, uh, it turns out your professor is pretty much incapable of that, but I can drop a basketball. And if I do that, and I would try to do this exposure fusion technique, right? So I have to take, like in this case, four photos instead of one. What's going to happen? Well, in each exposure, the basketball is going to move. So what's, what's my, my fused photograph going to look like? You're going to have four basketballs. Right? And so that's not too good. Um, in fact, I mean, you see that, right? Like, for example, another example where, where this happens often is... Um, that like iPhone panorama feature where you like kind of take your phone and you do one of these and it registers them all together. And then every once in a while there'll like be some poor like cat walking in the background that gets like squashed or something. Um, and essentially anytime you start basically making fiction, right? Like this is not a photo, this is four photos combined into one. Um, this can be a big issue. Um, even in these church scenes sometimes just because of like slight variations in lighting or maybe like I kick the camera tripod a little bit or something. Um, you typically have to register these images to each other and so on. Like, there's a bit of computer vision that has to happen. Moreover, there's a chicken and egg problem, right? I mean, even once you have those four pho uh, uh, photographs, you have to decide, like, which one of them to use in any given pixel. Uh, and, and blending these things carefully is, is a, a bit of an art. Even once you have, like, an exposure fusion image, like, maybe I can actually get a reasonable value at every pixel of the brightness. Then in some sense, I still have to cope. So that's like the input in some sense, right? Like, like the f-stop in my camera. I still have to cope with the fact that my display might not be too good, right? Like this horrible projector that we've all been looking at all semester has a horrible dynamic range made worse by whatever this material is. And so even if I took this beautiful photo of a church, of course, it's hard to wave my arms here because all of these things are happening in this, this hardware. Um, it's still, I mean, like I still have to choose one of these kind of f-stop things for how I display. Right? And so there's this reverse problem for display, which is how to take the, the colors that I have in my image, which might be quite accurate, and put them into the dynamic range of my display technology. And um, so, for example, one, one way you might do that is by using uh, something called tone mapping. The idea here is that essentially the color or the brightness of every pixel does not need to be linear in the numbers that you've stored on your pixel grid. Right? And so maybe you apply things like you know logs and composite darks and lights together in different ways, like stretch out the dark colors to use more of your dynamic range. Um, here I've purposefully chosen really horrible tone mapped images. So these people have like tried really, really hard to use the entire dynamic range of the display. I think we often see this in bad photography, uh, in particular this thing in the middle when you see these like photos of the sky that like look like you know like the the, the second coming. Um, Often what's going on here is this like kind of HDR, um, you know, like they've taken the sky and then mapped it to the entire dynamic range of your, your, your screen, which is probably not terribly realistic. Um, but, you know, <laughs> a, slight, a slight tone mapping, um, especially one if it's cognizant of the particular display that you're using, um, can be quite useful and, and, and have an interesting perceptual effect. One kind of funny thing, if you think about it too hard and gets a little bit philosophically weird, like, <laughs> Is any of these photos, or like this nice church photo here, is this reality? No. And moreover, it's not like this image, even though this like somehow looks better to us, this is not the set of colors that your eye would receive if you were standing in that room by a long shot. Essentially, somehow what we've done is like your eye is really good at compensating for like the dynamic range of the display that you're looking at. And it's amazing how quickly you're able to accept reality without even thinking about it, even though the fact is like this is a very bad simulation of, of real life. Um, there's all kinds of little like neural pathway things that, that, that get invoked here that are completely subconscious um, and, and are quite important to the, the technology we uh, develop. If you like this kind of stuff, audio is another great place where, where a lot of like really bizarre signal processing happens. Uh, right, of course, um, there are all kinds of different ways that you could do tone mapping, right? The simplest one would be to take all the intensities you see in your photograph, 
and just scale them to the range of intensities that your screen has. Um, you might get an image like this, this funky uh, church here. Is this Stanford Church? I think it is. Um, why does this look so bad, other than being a bit pixelated? It looks flat and dark, in particular. So what is that a good indicator that we probably did wrong? Remember, your eye is sensitive not to just absolute brightness, but yeah, ratios. And so a very typical thing to do is not to do um, tone mapping in the image color, but rather to kind of take the log of the whole image, do tone mapping there, and then map it back. Um, because again, we care about ratios. We don't care about um, just uh, intensities. And so here's like a slightly revised version it still doesn't look awesome, but it looks a little better than it did. OK, so that is all uh, we have to say about filters that only work on one pixel at a time. Um, of course, there's a whole other range of image filters, which like, do things like blur stuff out. right? And of course, in order to blur stuff out, I need to be cognizant of the content of my image at more than one location, um, because we're like, computing weighted uh, averages. right? So most interesting filters in real life, of course, involve more than one pixel at a time. And so that, that sort of formula that we wrote down before isn't quite sufficient. Can any of you guys give us some, some examples of image filters you've already encountered in this class that, that fall into this category? Yeah. Blurring. Blurring, yeah. Um, particularly like when we did mip mapping and like resizing of images, right? Those are like a color in one mip map pixel represents many colors in the original image. Uh, and, and so, yeah. Um, so for example, here's my mom's cat. Uh, and as we take Samantha and we shrink her down, this photo is a few years old. Samantha is now substantially larger. Um, that's right. Um, as we shrink her down, of course, one pixel in this output uh, image on the left-hand side uh, is, is, is actually representative of several pixels in, in this guy. And that's a good thing because the Sammy's fur here is, is quite high frequency, right? So I need to uh, uh, blur stuff out. Right? Or another example that we already saw in this course uh, is like if we have this very high texture, uh, frequency texture map, um, then essentially we need to, to scale this thing down carefully. And really it's exactly the same techniques when people are talking about image filtering and resizing that, that we've already covered here. Uh, so for example, um, we've talked about minification, which is making an image smaller. And the typical issue here is of course that like small distances in the minified image are large distances in the big one. So the reality is one pixel here is probably a bunch of pixels over there. Uh, and then, of course, this uh, famous test case we're sick and tired of looking at in this course by, the, by now uh, is, is the one that we're used to. So uh, as a tiny bit of review, what kind of weighted average should I probably compute? What's the best filter for this? Rhymes with blink. Sync, thank you. Uh, so if you recall from our Fourier uh, lecture, um, probably the best thing that we might do right, is to do what, what somebody might say pre-filtering. So like I take the image on the left, I blur it out, and then I sample like every other pixel because I've like killed all the high frequencies anyway, and that's what I get the, the as an output image here. And at least from a sort of uh, sampling and reconstruction perspective, typically people use sync or some approximation thereof uh, to uh, do that. In fact, we'll see some funny examples of what can go wrong if you don't use sync uh, later on in these slides. Uh, of course, the other thing we might do is take a small image of, of Sammy and try to make it larger. Um, and that's called magnification, and I think this is the easier of those two. Um, you, you know, we, we talked about uh, doing this in a bilinear fashion. Of course, bilinear filtering is not great, especially near edges, right? Like if I have a diagonal line in a photograph or an image and I bilinearly make it bigger, then I'm going to see the pixel grid um, inside of that. So in fact, there are algorithms out there that from a Fourier perspective are not doing any better, but like from a sort of semantic information kind of perspective might, might outperform. Um, so for example, um, here's like a weird, I don't know what this is, pattern on the upper left. If I upsample it using, or you know, try to make it larger using bilinear filtering, I get this blurry mess. Um, one thing you might do is try to detect all the images in here, or rather the edges in that image, and then upsample in a way that's cognizant of the sharp edges, like maybe even fit lines to them. And you know, of course, we're creating data where there isn't any. Like, these frequencies are not there in the image. So we can't really claim that this thing on the right is any better reconstruction than, like, the bilinear thing. But for, like, images that we tend to see in real life, this is a much better filter, right? So there are methods out there that do that. And of course, um, sampling uh, really can be used to, you know, rotate and scale, do all kinds of funny things. 
In fact, in, in an older offering in my graphics class, students would implement something called moving least squares, where you could kind of you know, move control points around. This is actually just done using skinning weights, right? Like, so if I have, um, I click a bunch of control points on Mona Lisa here, I can compute skinning weights. Remember, that's like a set of numbers that give you a weighted average. And now I can kind of make a weighted average transformation of every point. And that's like what I'm applying to get this, this filter here. OK. Um, how do we do this in practice? Well, remember, in that pre-filtering step, I need to take my image and convolve it against some filter, right? So remember what that means. That's kind of like I've got this little sliding thing, like sync. And the sync is like giving me the weighted average around a pixel. And I'm going to make a new image whose pixel colors are the weighted average with those given weights. Um, and so like here is like some kind of one dimensional example of that. The red is the averaging weight. So in this case, it's like just taking, you know, like maybe the three nearest pixels and averaging them together. Um, and so you can kind of see what that looks like, right? You're kind of sliding it across and then multiplying it by the red function and adding them together. OK, so in general, image convolution is the most simple image filter that isn't per pixel that everybody implements. These days, of course, is also the basic unit and lots of uh, state-of-the-art computer vision methods. Um, and uh, right, so if you want to implement this thing, so like here, I don't know why this is so dark, but we'll, we'll work with it. <laughs> Let's say I want to blur out this already extremely dark image on the left. I hope you guys can see this. Otherwise, you could load it on your laptop. I'm sorry about that. Um, and I want to convolve it against this filter. So this is like big in the middle and kind of drops off. Then essentially, the way I can think about this is taking this uh, green thing and kind of superposing it on top of the image, multiplying the two, and adding it all up. Right? So like here is like the red pixel, like the little red box on the right-hand side is the color I want. So as I slide this uh, green guy across, I get different weighted averages. And of course, um, the color gets brighter as I cross that line, but it's no longer constant like it was before. So typically, although not always, um, it's usually pretty ah. It's usually pretty clear. You've got like an image and then like a convolution filter, like the weights for the average. It's pretty clear which one is which. Turns out convolution is symmetric, so it kind of doesn't matter. But um, when we think about that convolution filter, sorry, uh, it usually satisfies. I'm like struggling with PowerPoint. Um, usually satisfies a few properties. Like usually it integrates to one or sums to one, right? Because you like to think of these as weighted averages, and often it's, it's relatively small, right? Um, Back in the day, we used to hand design a lot of these filters. Of course, these days, a lot of machine learning tools can do that for you. Um, but there, there are many ones that are worth knowing. So for example, blur kernels tend to just be big in the middle and drop off. Um, there, there are other ones as well. So for example, if I want to detect uh, edges in my photograph, one thing I might do is like put four in the center of my pixel and then minus ones on the neighbors. Um, if you think about what that's doing, it's saying, like, I want to find pixels where the value of the pixel is very different from the neighboring values. Anybody know what this thing is called in, in math, by the way? It's a div of grad, sometimes with a minus if you're a physicist. This is the Laplacian of your image. Um, take uh, 6838 if you want to have, like, literally, I think, six lectures that cover basically this little grid of four numbers. Um, a different one that you see in a lot of like 80s music videos is, is embossing, right? Which is this kind of funny effect that like makes some 3D stuff. And essentially all the emboss filter is doing is taking like one weighted average in the front and then subtracting off like a little window of, of weights in the back. As I think this image is, for whatever reason, this was like really popular in sitcoms in the 90s. Um, one of the big things here, of course, convolution is this filter that shows up everywhere in image processing. So it's worth thinking about. In fact, people build entire careers on how to implement it quickly. Um, and there are many different techniques. So the, the, the simplest thing you might do right, is say, like, well, for every output pixel, I'm just going to do you know, a little double for loop over the, the convolution filter and compute that weighted average. So if my image is n by n, my, my convolution kernel is m by m, then hopefully we can all agree that this is n squared m squared time, which uh, is slow. So um, Right, so this is uh, one of these, these uh, things that's, that's a big problem, right? It scales quadratically in the size of your data. Um, but it turns out for some of the common filters that we really care about in, in graphics, we can do a much better job. Um, so if you've taken Fourier analysis, that's one route to go. And that'll turn this into kind of more of an n log n looking thing. Um, but there are actually other tricks than that. 
Um, so for example, one of the common things people do, we actually mentioned it in our Fourier lecture, is to approximate the sink function with just like a Gaussian or a bell curve. Um, and it turns out that Gaussian convolution, like convolving an image against the bell curve, is something you can do ridiculously quickly using about 5 million different algorithms. Um, this is really fun. I love covering this topic. I wish I could just give three lectures on this, but I don't think you guys would put up with it. But I get to give at least one eighth of one. Um, in particular, how, how many of us have taken some version of a statistics class? How many of us remember the central limit theorem? Help me out. What is the central limit theorem? Yeah, come on. You guys are European students. You know math, right? What's the central limit theorem? That's right. So, so here's the, the, the basic point of, of central limit theorem. So I have a bunch of random variables that are all IID, like they're identically distributed. So like think, you know, I flip a coin a bunch of times. Um, and now I average the values of those variables. Actually, flipping a coin is not a great example because it's, it's, it's binary. But uh, in any event, I have some random thing and I do it a bunch of times. I do a bunch of experiments and average. And then that average becomes more and more distributed like a Gaussian like a bell curve. And it turns out the central limit theorem is a great way to justify a lot of image processing techniques. Because essentially what it's saying is if I take a distribution and I convolve it against itself enough times, which is roughly what goes on when you compute an average, then like pretty much no matter what thing I started with, I end up with the Gaussian. And so this is really sneaky because what it says is if I have an image filter, literally any image filter that's positive, and I just apply it like a thousand times, eventually that's going to be almost equivalent to blurring out my photograph. And so what I should do is just find some filter that's really easy to apply <laughs> and do that a bunch of times, um, rather than uh, convolving against something that's like a good approximation of a Gaussian. And that turns out to be the same thing. It's a really sneaky trick. I love this stuff. Um, there are other tricks you can do. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a second, actually. But, but before we do that, I should also mention um, Gaussian happens to be something separable, meaning that convolving an image against the Gaussian is the same thing as first blurring horizontally and then vertically, so you can shave off a factor of m that way. Um, in other words, we only really have to be good at convolving against one-dimensional Gaussians at the end of the day. Um, so the central limit theorem, from my perspective as a graphics person, says I can blur with any reasonable kernel enough times and the result starts to look Gaussian. What's an easy kernel to, to blur against? Any ideas? Identity. Identity turns out like it does converge to a Gaussian. It actually starts as a Gaussian, right? With variance zero. Thought you could whisper that one, huh? How about a box filter? So in particular, I can take every pixel and just average it with like its two neighbors. That's a simple uh, one to apply. There you go. See, box kind of looks like a Gaussian already. <laughs> um, so what happens if I apply it twice? Well, that turns out to be the same as like convolving the box against itself, right? So here's one convolution of the box filter against itself. This makes sense because the box is piecewise constant, so this becomes piecewise linear. If I do it again, I get this red curve. Another time, I get this thing. And so in fact, just by the central limit theorem, if I do one, two, three, four, five box filters on my image, that turns out to be a pretty good approximation of blurring my image out with a Gaussian. But box filters I can do in really, really efficient time. So here's how I can do it. Let's say that I have a bunch of pixel colors in a line. I'm going to choose numbers that are. So by the way, obviously, it's equivalent rather than averaging to just sum over the box. We can divide by 3 later. So let's say that I have, what are some pixel colors? 1, 2, 4, negative 1, 7. I'm bad at arithmetic, so we're about to fail. Uh, and let's say I want to co uh, convolve against a box of size 3. Yep. So let's say. What is the sum of 1, 2, and 4? Quick. 7. Thanks, guys. So, so one thing that I could do if I wanted to convolve the box against this guy would be to sum these three numbers. That's probably fine for a box of size 3, but if it was a box of size 30, that would get kind of expensive. A different thing that I can do is the following. I can take 7, subtract 1, and add negative 1. And now I have the value here which is 5. <laughs> and indeed, 4 minus 1 is 3, plus 2 is 5. Right? 
So what is the big O of that operation? Well, it's just one. I subtract one on the left, I add one on the right. I have this little moving window, right? And so now I have no factor of M at all in applying this. It's just one pass across the uh, array here, and I can convolve against a box, right? Just using this, this basic little, little trick here. So what does that mean? Well, now if it, it, you know, I have k iterations of my box filter, then the overall complexity here is n squared k, which is actually not so bad. Um, and so that's the basic trick here. Um, there are many variations of this. If you take like an electrical engineering signal processing class, you'll learn many of these. Another one is to use IIR filter. So this would be like take every pixel and kind of just average it with the output of the filter to the left of it. And you get this kind of like decay thing. That's a little bit trickier because it's like biased to the one side. So you kind of have to go like back and forth a few times. Or yet another trick is something called the Gaussian pyramid which is closer to how we talked about MIP mapping, where like a different way to blur out an image would be to kind of shrink it down a bunch and then sample it back up or something like that. Basically, the high level takeaway you guys should get in this undergrad course is that if you want to blur something out, there are a lot of options and it should be fast. <laughs> um, and that, like this is built in your hardware. There's a lot of, of, of stuff you can do here. Um, <laughs> well, the, this is one of these issues where like I think a lot of us don't think about it and like Photoshop does it really well. So like we just, yeah, there's a dog, I know. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, it turns out getting the details of these filters right is really important. Um, one thing that, uh, by the way, you might know is that like the high-end graphics, like photo editing software, typically does not just store the edited photo, but it actually stores the original photograph plus a sequence of edits. Any idea why? Yeah. So basically, I mean, look, looking at this example, the rotation of 30, uh, by 30 degrees, uh, 12 times, Imagine like if we just stored the intermediate results and just each time applied the operation, we would lose a lot of uh, fidelity because sometimes the pixels just don't map nicely, and we would have to interpolate. Yeah, that's that's so right. This way, uh, for example, if we do this, it's basically just nothing happens because we just uh, and we preserve the entire fidelity. Of the yeah, like I think you know a simple way to put it is just like every time we do one of these operations, you know, we do rounding, approximation, and so on. And, and you don't want to just lose the original photograph in that, in that process, right? I think the most famous examples of this are like, uh, you download some of these memes that people have downloaded and JPEG compressed and then put on the internet a thousand times, so there's deep fried memes or something like that. <laughs> and um, essentially, uh, you know, what's going on there is that they did a poor job of this. They didn't store the original image. And like every single time they saved it, they have compression artifacts that get kind of compounded together. Um, but even for these filters, uh, this can be a problem. So, Remember I told you that, like, well, the very first thing that we did was say like, oh, maybe approximating sync with a Gaussian is an okay thing to do. Um, so here is uh, Andrew Adams' uh, dog. Andrew Adams, I think, works at Google. He's a photography uh, person. Basically, he made this slide, and I'm too lazy to make it myself with Samantha. Um, so here, we've taken the dog, and we've rotated it 30 degrees 12 times. Uh, if you do your mental math quick, what's 30 times 12? You can probably guess from this image. Thank you, Ari, 360. Um, of course, instead, I could rotate 5 degrees 72 times, and what starts to happen? Yeah, but it's not JPEG artifacts, actually. Do you, do you see what's going on specifically here? Edges are, okay, so I mean, there's a circle, obviously, but, but uh, ignoring that, the, um, yeah, and edges are examples of what? High frequencies in your image, right? And that's where you've done the worst approximation of sync if you just have a blur filter, right? Because sync is like wiggling up and down, and this thing just like dropped off to zero, right? In fact, what do you think it's gonna look like if I rotate one degree 360 times? <laughs> yeah, here, here's what it looks like. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, in fact, um, there are a lot of different things that can go wrong here. Um, so here, the uh, particular blur uh, kernel that we, we used, I hate this, this thing because I don't speak whatever language, uh, what, Lonzosh, I believe, uh, three uh, filter is some approximation of sync um, that's pretty common in photography, but notice that it goes slightly above and slightly below. And if you get your rounding wrong, or just because this isn't quite the sync that we really want, um, what can happen is that those like slightly too big and too small numbers compound, um, and you get the kind of garbage that you have here. So anyway, this is just a quick thing to, to mention that these are like the kind of details that are easy to elide while you're engineering these systems until they come into play. And they come often in like very subtle ways, right? I mean, like if you saw this, you might not even notice that there's an artifact. 
Um, but when you start playing with Photoshop, you can find many of these. OK, um, there are all kinds of good filters out there that are worth being aware of. Another um, one that's very typical is something called an unsharp mask. This is a good example of um, something that people like in, in perception, where like, remember, again, your eye is really sensitive to sharp edges. So one thing you might want to do is actually accentuate the sharp edges. Uh, and that turns out to be a thing you can build off of this Gaussian filter quite easily. So here, what you do is you take your original uh, image, you blur it out. That's I star G here. And then you take the I minus I star G. So if you think about it, that's like just the high frequency stuff, right? I subtracted out the blurred guy. And I'm going to multiply that by a constant bigger than one, or bigger than zero, actually. Anything is fine. What does this do? <laughs> takes the high frequency part of my image and it kind of accentuates it, right? Uh, and so that creates, um, <laughs> okay, if you do it correctly, it can create something like this cat on the bottom where now the fur somehow looks a little more, more detailed than it did before, right? Because those are the high frequency parts of my image. Of course, if you do it poorly on the left-hand side, you get like God knows what artifact. Um, a good way to detect the unsharp mask if you're trying to do some photo uh, sleuthing um, is to try to find regions in your image with just like kind of flat, sharp edges. Because if you think about it, right, this edge will become blurry when you blur the image out. So when you accentuate the difference between this thing and a blurry version, what you'll get is near this edge, right, it'll kind of go to black. And then, like, you know, it'll kind of underestimate and then overestimate. Does that make sense? Um, anybody know what this is called? Oops. Uh, sorry. It's called a halo artifact um, for obvious reasons. Um, so here's, like, a really bad uh, <laughs> uh, version of this. This is blown out. All right, so um, in general, incidentally, you might ask a question, which is like, convolution is an example of uh, a thing that you can do to an image that's linear, right? If I take two images, and then I add them together, and then I convolve them against a the filter, that's the same thing as convolving the images against a filter and then adding them together, Sim similarly with scaling. Uh, it turns out, thanks to Fourier or whatever your favorite uh, theorem, uh, those are the only filters on, on images uh, that are um, spatially invariant, like the kind of like if you shift your image, don't get affected, um, and are, are linear. The problem is that that means that they're not really cognizant of where you are in your photograph. So like it's easy enough to like blur stuff out, but you can't be cognizant of edges. Um, if, you, if you go into computational photography, you take Fredo's course just as a quick preview, oftentimes what people will do is they'll say like, well, this unsharp mask isn't too good because essentially I'm like grabbing light colors from like the background or some like completely different object and kind of putting them into a different region in my photo. And if I think about that too hard, it really, it really doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so a very typical thing to do might be to take like my blur kernel and make it depend on where I am, right? So like if I'm at this pixel right near this boundary, maybe I actually only average with pixels to my right because I don't want to average with stuff on the other side of the edge. Um, and there are many image filters out there that do that kind of thing. Um, has anybody ever heard of one? Anybody know in Photoshop the right button to hit to, to make this happen? To blur out an image, but to try and preserve the sharp edges? There are actually a bunch of different options. Yeah? Is it like alpha so alpha masking is closer to what we talked about earlier in lecture. Um, any ideas? Entertainingly, the mathematical name for this and the one that Photoshop shows are completely different from one another. Um, so uh, one of the simple ones is something called bilateral filtering. Um, uh, in fact, actually, Fredo, uh, speaking of, of Fredo here, was, I think, one of the early developers of algorithms for, for actually doing this efficiently. Um, I think in Photoshop, this is called something weird, like surface blur. I don't know why. Um, for some reason, the people that make this image processing software like to take the mathematical and technical literature and the stuff, rename it completely, and then put it in a complicated menu that none of us can find. Um, but that's, that's, that's life. So, so the basic idea here is like, let's say that I have a photograph with a sharp edge. So here, like height is color. Then like, I only want to take weighted averages with stuff that's like on the same side of that sharp edge as I am. But if you think about it, that's really hard to define mathematically, right? Because like, what is that sharp edge but a big variation in pixel color? Like who's to determine the difference between that and like these little wiggles here? Um, so in the bilateral filter, what you do is you have a spatial kernel. So that would be like the Gaussian. And then maybe you multiply it by a local kernel, like the difference, like a Gaussian indifference of intensity in the image. Um, so like here, that would make this like weird chopped off bell curve here. Uh, and that's what you convolve against. So this picture is easy to agree with. But the problem is computationally, it's really expensive, as I've described it, right? Because essentially, my convolution kernel depends on where I am. So I can't do all these tricks like we talked about before. Um, 
I'm going to leave it there. Take Fredo class. That I think he covers like fast algorithms for doing this kind of stuff. I'm sure he does because like he built his like tenure case on this kind of thing. Um, and and it's, uh, yeah, these are really cool uh, techniques. So like for example, here's a photograph. If I just Gaussian blur it, I get something like the middle, which probably isn't terribly helpful. Um, on the right hand side, I've applied the bilateral filter, and you can see that some of like the sharp features of this person are are washed out now. But of course, the the sharp uh, edges are still there. Working with filters like uh, bilateral filter is difficult, right? Because there's like some weird dividing line between noise and sharp edge that's hard to define in practice. And you can even see that in this image, right? Like if you look in the background up here, the grass gets kind of blurred out. And as you move here, somehow the contrast increased a little bit. And now there's high frequencies uh, hiding in there. This is just the tip of the iceberg. If you like this stuff, I mean, you can do it for days. I, I, I love these kinds of things. So another uh, example of such a filter is a median filter, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, so now, like, you put, replace every pixel color with the median of all the colors in some neighborhood around your pixel. So for one, that can fill in missing data in your image, right? Like, I could, like, draw a little neighborhood around one of these mix of missing pixels, take the median, and put that as the missing color. And that turns out to be kind of a reasonable thing. The median, you might remember from stats class, is like a robust thing to estimate, right? Like, if I have a bunch of outliers, then the median kind of ignores them. So oftentimes for images with like speckle noise, like very low light photography, this is a nice choice because it just throws that stuff away. It doesn't try to like average that out or something. So as a quick uh, recap, I mean, image processing, filtering, computational photography is definitely worthy of its own course. As with many of the topics we've covered, I, I mean, essentially what, what'll happen if you take graduate courses in computer graphics is that any one of the roughly two week topics in this course becomes its own course at, at the graduate level. Like I teach a big geometry course, Fredo does uh, photography, Wojtek does um, manufacturing, which we haven't even touched at all in this course. Um, we have new professors that are joining us that are doing things like hardware and, and, and so on. So maybe there'll be even more in the coming years. Um, weirdly, we don't really have anybody that teaches rendering here at MIT, but maybe someday. Um, similarly with, with simulation, but we're working on that. Um, but this is another great example of one of these topics that like, you can really dive into, and, and they're really exciting. and cool kind of technical content to be had. So in any event, uh, with that, if you have not done your homework five, uh, your late days are ticking away, and this is your last opportunity to use them. So might I suggest you, well, either procrastinate until you're out of late days or, or actually finish your assignment and then focus on your project. I'm more than happy to consult on your project anytime. It's kind of fun for me to see like a million different graphics topics in any given moment and try to like digest them all. Um, and yeah, we will see you on Thursday and your nano quiz is on Thursday also, so don't forget that. <laughs> All right, let me uh, turn this thing off. Uh, yeah. Sorry.